There we go. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Tim Shriver. I am enormously honored to have as one of the roles I play in life, perhaps in some ways my most important being the chair of the International Special Olympics Movement. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome all of you from around the world, uh, experts in health, experts in social change, experts in caring for and nurturing the hopes and dreams of our fellow citizens, experts in self-advocacy, all of you, to this first ever global health event. But keep in mind, this is not an event that's just a webinar to inform you. It's a webinar, it's an engagement opportunity to engage you. It's not just a teaching moment, it's an opportunity to challenge each of us to action and change. And it's not just about information, it's about inspiration, the necessary impetus for all of us to make the changes that are urgently needed in our country and around our world today. I'm thrilled to be joined today by my co-host, the inimitable, the extraordinary Kira Byland. Kira, or KB, as you'll hear her called often, is on the Special Olympics Europe Eurasia Athlete Leadership Council. She is the chair of that council. She's a global health messenger, a multi-talented athlete. Welcome, Kira Byland. Thanks, Tim. Hello, everyone. It's really important that my voice, but also others with intellectual disabilities, are heard. If one of us is denied to the health access, then that's actually denying all of us. When the pandemic started, only people with the label learning disability on their record, records meant they were actually able to be put into a category where they could actually get given the jam. But if you had the label difficulty, that meant you were left out and that isn't very nice. And when the information came out from the government, they had an easy read version with pictures and words. But for me, those pictures and words did not match up. And that made me very upset and hurt by that, that I wasn't valued as a person with a disability. Everybody needs someone to help them, support them and be that champion. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Kira, for starting us off with exactly the right message. Uh, if the system denies one of us, it denies all of us, because sooner or later, my brothers and sisters, we will all be in need of a system and vulnerable to it. Sooner or later, as Kira has just told us, we will all need someone to support us. And if that person isn't there, uh, we will all be left out. We will all be on the margins. We will all be in the waiting room, unable to access care. We will all find ourselves facing a medical professional who says, I don't understand you. We will all find ourselves, as Kira has just told us poignantly, powerfully, not on the list. Injustice for this community is injustice eventually for everyone on this call. And the impetus of this moment and this challenge is not to let that urgency let us go. There are 200 million people in the world with an intellectual challenge, but all the rest of us are, all, are also in play. Our folks, brothers and sisters with an intellectual challenge are more likely to die 15 to 20 years earlier than their non-disabled peers, not because of their disability, but because of the systems, the neglect. That's 15 to 20 years of lost life. <clears throat> It's unacceptable. In this recent pandemic, our athletes, our community, people with intellectual differences, six times more likely to die from COVID than their non-disabled peers, not because of their disability, but because of the neglect in the system. This week, we recognize the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, but it's not enough to recognize a day, my friends. It's not enough, we have to act. And so today we are so proud to be celebrating the gift of Tom Golisano. Tom is known all over the business world uh, as this extraordinary entrepreneur, as a person who made a big bet on the little guy. He made a big bet that matching technology and services for small to medium-sized businesses, that those people were being left out of the big systems. And he says, I'm making my bet on those folks. And it's exactly the same bet he's making with his philanthropy through the 
Golisano Foundation. It's exactly the same bet that Ann Costello, the leader of that foundation, has made on our athletes and on you, the healthcare practitioners who are determined to change the system for and with them. It's the bet that the people at the margins have the secret to the belonging and justice for the whole. It's the bet that the little guy, the person so often unseen, is the critical ingredient in making us all capable of being seen. So we're grateful to Tom and we're grateful to all of our partners. You'll see on the screen now some of the partners who are joining us both today and in this extraordinary work. Uh, of course, our friends at the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States, where I'm coming to you from. But we've also had extraordinary help from Lions Clubs International, from Essilor, from the MetLife Foundation, Safilo and Starkey for hearing aids, UNICEF, uh, UNFPA, so many other organizations at the local and national level who have heard the call of our athletes, who have heard Kira's voice and said, we're in. Uh, injustice for one is injustice for all. We are in to make the difference. Let's, if we can, kick off this celebration as we prepare to meet some of the most extraordinary leaders in the world. And I don't mean that by exaggeration. I mean, you will meet on this, uh, in this experience, the leading healthcare voices, scientists, scholars, practitioners, and change agents in the world. Before we meet them, Let's go to the video and get an overview of the extraordinary work that Tom, the Special Olympics community, and all of you are doing around the world. Let's go to the videotape. About 12 years ago now, it was Christmas morning, 4.30 in the morning. And I got this call from this surgeon. And he said, this guy, he never should have died this way. This was a gentleman in his 40s, and he had intellectual disability, and he lived in a group home. He was so constipated that nobody had paid attention for the couple weeks that he ended up getting an impaction and essentially getting a giant infection where his bowels needed to be cut out. And he died during that surgery. I will never forget that. Somebody's got to do something about it. Too often, the basic health care needs of people with intellectual disabilities are simply not met by our system. The cost of that failure is in lost lives. That time of diagnosis is some of the hardest times for any families. <laughs> so many of our parents so many of our moms and dads and brothers and sisters hear something that damages them, that wounds them for life. No, your child is not okay. No, your child will not be okay. When Violet was born and the doctor came in and told us that she had Down syndrome and was just, it was delivered very coldly. There was no congratulations. I cried when she was born, and I don't want a parent to ever cry when their child is born. Potato chips, oh, potato chips. Oh, <laughs> oh that's awesome, right? It is in that moment that we hope medicine can change. So the doctors and nurses come back to those moms and dads and say, we have precious news for you. Your child will be different than every other child. And we are here to support you in helping to make sure your child lives the fullest life possible. You ready? Which ball do you want? Okay, so how do we call? We need yeah, the right thing. doctors who are talking in the right language, who are supporting families, who have the right resources. I had heard about young athletes through Special Olympics. It's for children ages two to seven, both with intellectual disabilities and typically developing athletes. It was a great introduction to gross motor skills, fine motor skills, the sport skills needed. What's so great about Special Olympics is that it builds on itself session after session. It gives you a central place to really have this focused health effort. Woo! Awesome. 
When I was in medical school and when I was in residency and all of my training, we never actually thought about people with intellectual disabilities as a group that we needed to learn about. I was struggling trying to find doctors that would look past my disability and just treat me as a person. We started recognizing that people with intellectual disabilities came to the games and 25% of them had vision problems that weren't addressed. You'll hear in this ear a beep. You heard beep? Okay. Same with hearing, same with cavities. They would come with big abscesses in their mouths, all the way down to not having the right size shoes. We committed ourselves to making sure that if we were going to build playing fields of justice and joy, that we were going to ensure that our athletes showed up to them healthy. In our healthy communities, we are out to erase health disparities through our screenings and then making sure that you get the care that you need. Hello, 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 hello. We also advocate for changes in systems around the world so that any person with an intellectual difference has a chance for equality, for dignity, for justice, and for a full life. Nice and tight, sit back. Good, keep that bar close. Before I got involved with Special Olympics, I wanted to be healthier, I just didn't know how. Cool. Nice job. Catch <laughs> your Thanks. breath. We'll do another set in a minute. One issue I've had was I have really bad feet, and I would go to doctors, and it was always just like, well, a lot of people with disabilities wear braces. Through the Special Olympics, I met a clinical director that fitted me for braces. It's at least getting me where I can walk properly and safely. Right. Cool. Let's do six all the way down. Now I got training and became a health messenger, and now she's actually helping a lot of other athletes do the same thing. I want to really teach people the importance of inclusive health. I want to reach doctors, nurses, specialists to really look at the person. We are making sure that we train the healthcare workforce so that they can treat people with intellectual disabilities. With our healthy communities now, we're in 122 U.S. states and countries all around the world. We also have been able to help people like Derek in Canada. Through our healthy communities, he lost 140 pounds and was able to go off of his diabetes medicines. Suba is a young girl in Pakistan. She has cerebral palsy. And in the course of just a few months in our Young Athletes Early Intervention Program, Suba actually started to walk. Tom Galasano and the Galasano Foundation have done more to advance the healthcare rights and potential of people with intellectual disabilities than any foundation in the world. They have given us the chance to imagine that people with intellectual disabilities might actually get to the playing fields healthy, might actually see a doctor and see someone who cared about all of them, might actually have access to the system with the same dignity, the same gifts, the same possibility as anyone else. We're standing up. And people with intellectual disabilities and their families are standing up more than ever before. And that gives me hope.
Wow. Uh, Kira, I know you agree with me. That's the that's a brand new video, by the way. Many of the stories and scenes and information there is new, even to me, and I'm sure to all of you. And so we're grateful to all those who contributed to making it, but more importantly, to the voices that were raised there. We couldn't be luckier, and I mean this, to have the two people that will follow that video with us today. I'm proud. I'm going to take the, the role of introducing my friend, the Honorable Mike Lake, who is a six-term conservative member of parliament uh, from Edmonton, Wisconsin. Uh, he's the shadow minister in his government for mental health, addiction, and suicide. Think of the linkage, mental health, addiction, and suicide. Mike has two children. Uh, I want to point out that we have a member of a political party here, not because this is a political issue, but because it crosses political parties and issues. It crosses national and geographic boundaries. It crosses all those. Don't anyone listen to any of this thinking this is a partisan issue for this party or this person to gain advantage. Mike, thank you for joining us. Kira, over to you. Thanks, Tim. So I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Vikram Patel. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Patel is a professor of global health and Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow at Harvard Medical School. His work has focused on the burden of mental health problems and the use of community resources for their prevention and treatment. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Patel for joining us today. Over to you, Tim. Mike, over to you. Well, it is so great to be here today. And uh, um, just a quick explanation as to why it's so important for, for me to be here. First of all, when Tim asks you to be part of something like this, you say yes, because Tim is about the most action-oriented person I know. And uh, I know that I'm never wasting my time when I'm on a meeting with Tim, uh, because it's going to lead to something. And I'll share with you, I, this is very low tech, I'm going to share with you the inspiration, if you can see, yes, you can, I think there, that is my son, whoops, I'll go this way, that's my son, Jaden, that's uh, the last uh, time I saw Jaden this uh, over the last couple of weeks, because I'm in Ottawa now, that's in Edmonton, uh, where we live, and that was Jaden at, at Special Olympics Bowling, Jaden is a Special Olympian, um, he's involved in bowling, it brings him un unbelievable joy in his life to be able to do that. And uh, as I was watching that video, Tim, I'll tell you, it hit really close to home. So Jaden is nonverbal, um, 26 years old with autism, and um, talk a lot in, in presentations around the world, some that I've done with Vikram, um, about, uh, about some of the challenges, particularly with the abstract world uh, that, that Jaden experiences. I couldn't tell you if Jaden's ever had a headache because he isn't able to communicate things like where his body is, it, it, how his body is feeling and where his body might be hurting at any point in time. Um, it's very difficult to tell if he's, you kind of have to, to pay attention to the look on his face or the expressions that he's wearing or his temperature or whatever it might be to know how he's feeling. And I do fear for, uh, you know, for down the road, um, you know, for, for him from a health perspective, because of that, it just takes people who are really tuned into him paying attention um, to understand his health situation at a given given point in time. Now, I'm not an expert on that. That's my life experience with Jaden as his dad. Uh, we're fortunate that Vikram is an expert and probably knows more about the, you know, the global state uh, on these uh, on these issues than anybody I know personally. So um, Vikram, maybe to start off, um, you know, th this conversation really centers on on inclusion, you and I have talked many times about inclusion. And maybe before we get into the sort of health impact, maybe just talk about the general state of inclusion for people with intellectual disability around the world. Uh, first of all, Mike, I kind of say what fun it is to be back again on a panel with you. Um, I'm joining you and all the others from India today where I've uh, been based for the last few weeks and I will be till March before I return to Boston. Um, and so what I really want to focus on is the circumstances faced by people with intellectual disabilities. And I see this as a broader group. For example, uh, you describe your son who has difficulties with communication. This is another kind of disability that often coexists with intellectual disability. Uh, it's, it's really inspirational to see what uh, the Golisano Foundation and Special Olympics are doing in many parts of the world. But my perspective really comes from the global south. Uh, and I think it's important to emphasize that more than 80% of people with intellectual disability and other forms of 
these hidden disabilities live in the global south. And I want to just remember back to work that I did in Mozambique, one of the largest countries in the world, about 20 years ago, Mike, when I was um, working as a consultant for the World Health Organization and the Ministry of Health. And they asked us, uh, the Mozambique government asked us to quantify the, the numbers of individuals with intellectual disability in the country so that they could actually then uh, get a sense of the level of need. And here was the interesting thing we found. We found a lot of kids with intellectual disability and various forms of communication disabilities, not surprising because uh, oftentimes intellectual disability is associated with things like cerebral malaria, extreme forms of deprivation and so on. And so you found a lot of kids in, in this country, which is one of the poorest in the world. But here's a curious thing. We found no adults. And it, it, it was this kind of, a, you know, this incredibly scary uh, uh, you know, discovery that clearly this implied that these children hadn't even grown into adolescence, leave aside adulthood, um, of a con and because they lived with a condition that in and of itself was a lethal, but was associated with so much stigma and discrimination that pervaded every aspect of their lived experiences from education, which we know is a profoundly important aspect of promoting health and well-being and life expectancy, and of course, the quality of healthcare they received and their opportunities in the workplace. I also want to say one more thing. It's not just at the, uh, you know, in, in, in health and education that you see this, dis this discrimination, but also in everyday interactions in society. It wouldn't come as a surprise to you, Mike, and it certainly wouldn't come as a surprise to anyone in the US that there's a disproportionate number of people with intellectual disability in prisons around the world. Uh, and this is, again, a place where they face enormous deprivations and violence. So I want to end by saying, the, the disability movement has been profoundly successful uh, in promoting inclusion in all aspects of society, including the healthcare system, in changing hearts and minds. However, there are hidden disabilities and there is almost a kind of caste system that operates in the disability recognition and the movements around the world, such that disabilities that are not visible to the naked eye, intellectual communication and behavioral disabilities are still systematically ignored across the world. So we've we've talked in the past, we've been on panels and, and with Tim as well, talking about education and inclusion in education and the importance of that. How does this inclusion conversation, um, you and I haven't spoken as much about health on the panels that we've been on. How does that translate to the health income out outcomes? What does the what does the research show on health outcomes as it relates to um, this, the very issues we're talking about. Well, Mike, the single most important fact about the health of a population is that it's not determined by the medical care you receive, but by the social structures uh, that, that, that accompany you through your early life and through most of your life. And with that in mind, I mean, let's be honest, some of the greatest gains in life expectancy that we've seen in our, all our countries has been due to public health uh, investments uh, that also target the social determinants of health. For example, the biggest reason why infectious diseases have become a rarity, with of course COVID being a, a recent exception, but we think of the old infectious diseases have become a rarity in most parts of the developed world is because of improvements in sanitation, hygiene, and nutrition. So I strongly believe the issue of better health for people with intellectual disabilities must start by addressing their exclusion from social spaces. But to do so, we must build, and I want to repeat this, awareness of all disabilities, not just the ones that people can see with the naked eye. And this is in itself a major, major challenge because intellectual disabilities carry the most stigma. And autism, something I know which is very dear to your heart, is something that most people in the world don't even recognize as a disability. So inclusion has to be the ultimate goal. Uh, and this requires for us to move from the equivalent of ramps for persons with motor disabilities to understanding how inclusion can take place in all spaces from schools and the workplace to the health services and the sports field. I know you've done a, a lot of research on sort of teaching regular citizens 
to sort of deliver. And I, I know your work on mental health. I think you were named Times uh, one of Times 100 most influential people in I think 2016. I'd, I'd argue that's just ongoing. Um, but uh, you, you've done great work on spreading the word about what regular people can do to deliver evidence-based interventions. How do, how does that translate into intellectual disabilities and how we sort of shape our societies um, around around these things? Mike, one of the most important innovations that has come from the global south when it comes to healthcare delivery, and it's, a, it's an innovation that comes from the very frugal, uh, resource-constrained environments uh, of the global south, which has very few of the healthcare resources uh, in the world. Um, for example, only about 10% of all the mental health resources in the world are there in the countries that account for about 90% of the world's population. And so the innovation that I think is the most exciting one that has come from this part of the world, this huge part of the world, is the task sharing, the sharing of healthcare interventions to non-physician workers. This is a very diverse group of people, community health workers, um, peers, and even lay people. And of course, a lot of my work has focused on this. And for intellectual disabilities, a central role that these community health workers play is in supporting the person and their families towards the goals of both better health and greater inclusion in the various social spaces I spoke to earlier. Mike, I think we can all agree that we need to demedicalize conversations on disability. We need to emphasize the psychosocial, the non-medical. And in doing so, we need to actually champion the agency of persons with disability to be part of the solution, rather than to being the problem that they're so often perceived to be uh, as a burden to their families and their communities. Indeed, we should completely flip that around and suggest that people with disability and their families are central to the solution of expanding access to good quality care and inclusion in their own communities. So as we kind of talk about changing society and those kind of things, and by the way, I've kind of just thrown away my notes and as usual, I just wind up having a conversation with you, Vikram. But, um, you know, as we have this conversation about, um, you know, changing societies and culture and addressing stigma and those kind of things, um, we also have to talk about institutions and, and you know, the, the institutions in the developed world, developing world, uh, we've got a lot of influential people who are watching this conversation today and going to be watching the important conversations that uh, um, that come out of this. Uh, what advice would you have in terms of that advocacy? What what are the, the you know what are the, the 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 easy? There are no easy wins, but I guess in a sense, where should the priorities be right now to make the fastest progress we can? Because I, I mentioned the sort of action orientation earlier. We have to get beyond having. Zoom meetings about all of these things and, and and endless conversations about the same thing, and we have to actually create some action. Where is the easiest place for us to, to, to build some momentum? Well, you know, if I had to think in a very um, uh, hopeful and aspirational way, I would say it is to actually see the person with intellectual disability as a person, um, you know, to, to really champion the personhood of every individual, because every person counts, Mike. Of course, I know you agree with that, and that might sound like a very idealistic statement, but I think it's an important statement to make at the very outset. Um, I think the key issue for me that we have to address is stigma. I think it's the elephant in the room, uh, the stigma that operates everywhere but within every sector of society. Um, and then twinned with that, the biomedical framing of disabilities of people with some kind of medical problem, um, which then leads to this kind of nihilistic view, because the moment you have a, a medical problem, the immediate next thought is, can we cure these people? Um, and then, of course, you know, this comes in the way of recognizing that these are individuals who are part of the diversity that makes humankind so fascinating and so interesting and makes our societies what they are. I think we have to move beyond this idea of burden, uh, you know, which comes, which, which is twinned with the notion of disease and, 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 and suffering and recognize individuals with disability as individuals. Uh, who are no different from anyone else in terms of their rights and their entitlements. I wanted to also say that I think the Special Olympics, uh, Mike, uh, you know, are profoundly important here. You know, sports can and have had an incredible influence in modern society in breaking down prejudice. Consider, for example, 
the, the diversity in sports, I mean, I'm talking about you know, racial and ethnic diversities and you know, teams like football, soccer teams and hockey teams and so on, how profoundly important that's been in building national identities in so many different parts of the world. Sports for me can and does the same for persons with disabilities. Though I, I think what Special Olympics is doing right now is so profoundly important, expanding the range of opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities to play, to feel the joy and the pride to participate and, and compete. Mike, I have a question for you. I've just been doing all the talking here. You are a father and now you are the shadow minister of mental health in this important country, Canada. What's on top of your list to actually see greater inclusion and better health? for people with intellectual disabilities? I'm, I'm just dying to hear what you're gonna do. <laughs> it's a big question, it's a big question. I thought I was you know, taking a break from the uh, questions and answers, the debate that goes on here. Hopefully this won't be too, uh, too controversial. You know, I'm gonna tell Jaden's story a little bit. I'm gonna you know, reference his sister. We did an interview um, several years ago now when, when Jaden's sister was 13 um, and uh, when Jaden was 16. And the interviewer asked a really tough question. And, uh, he, he said, uh, do you, Janae, I'm gonna ask you a tough question. Do you ever wish that your brother was quote unquote normal like every other kid? And Janae, 13 years old says, well, to be honest, uh, I've, I, you know, Jaden's been my brother. Jaden said autism since I've known Jaden since I was born. So I don't exactly know what a normal brother is like. Uh, so Jaden kind of is my normal. And he says, you love him just the way he is. And, and Jaden's sitting there with a big smile on his face, sitting with his sister. And he go, she goes, uh, if Jaden was like cured or didn't have autism anymore, I we'd kind of miss the Jaden we have now. And when I speak to you know organizations around the world, a lot to students trying to increase awareness, I point out that Janae didn't really have a choice. She's three and a half years younger than Jaden. So you know, Jade, she was born into a family with a brother with autism, but the school they went to had a choice. And the school included Jaden in a regular classroom with a full-time aide. And because of that, every kid in that school would say that their life is, you know, immeasurably better because Jaden was in their life, because their normal included Jaden because the school made a point of doing that. And, and, you know, in the work that I do with the platform I have and getting to work with great people like, like you and Tim and, and, and so many of the people on this call, I mean, that that's, I think, the vision is that we... You know, we get deliberate about it and we recognize that when we do this the right way, um, those other people around the world, everybody else is going to benefit from it, too. And uh, um, and we'll all benefit because the experience is better, but also because we, we benefit from the skills and abilities and potential that we unlock as well. So um, this has been a great conversation. I'm looking at the time. I know I've gone on, gone on a little bit long. We've gone on a little bit long as we do, Vikram. And I apologize for that, Tim. I will no. say, while I've got the floor, I just want to say a huge thank you to Tom because uh, this event wouldn't be happening without uh, without him and that foundation. And so, um, thank you to Special Olympics. Thank you, Tim, for including us in your day today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Can I ask just one? Uh, do we did we lose everybody, or can I? I guess I, I guess the way these things go, I can't ask a question, but. I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Patel and Mike, both of you, but in a special way to carry this question Dr. Patel asked us forward, which is how do we encourage people to see the person? In some ways, the entire mission, and I mean the entire mission of the Special Olympics movement is captured in those words, see the person. See the person, I would argue, as gifted not just to see the person as some diagnosis. And well, I see Dr. Patel's back now. If, if I could ask you, you're, you're operating in the highest levels of elite decision makers at elite universities, elite ministries, elite government entities, elite opinion leaders, foundations. How have you, what's the strategy for shifting uh, this stigma that you've seen most effective in that network? If you were walking the halls of the Harvard Medical School, uh, what what moves the, prof the the faculty and the students there most effectively? Can I ask that? I guess I'm over time too, but I can't help it. <laughs> I think there's one thing more than anything else. It's like it's having people like Kira speak directly to them, not on behalf of them. Uh, I have never seen anything more powerful, and it's just so wonderful to meet you, Kira, even though it's on Zoom. Uh, it's absolutely the most inspirational thing to see people speak for themselves. Mm. Beautiful, concise, uh, and true. 
so thank you both uh, for joining us uh, and for helping us uh, accept this challenge for it, uh, with all the complexity uh, and uh, all the challenge that it really represents. This is, we're not here to do something easy. Um, but as someone said a long time ago, we, we try to do things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Uh, this one's hard and that's what we're gonna succeed at it. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Dr. Patel for joining us. Kira, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you both for joining us. I'm excited to introduce our next panel. It's called Advocating for Inclusive Healthcare. This is a pre-taped panel featuring Dr. Manute Oz, an attending physician at New York Presbyterian, Columbia Medical Center, the host of Dr. Oz Show. Dr. Oz will be interviewing Karen Ryan, an inclusive activist and a mother of a 12-year-old Violet Lees who has Down syndrome. Ailey Zainab, a Special Olympics Pakistan athlete who loves to compete in basketball. Alongside her sister-in-law, Marine Ufan, Derek Butlia, a Nova Scotia, an athlete who is a multi-sports athlete. His coach, Don Vetus, and his home support, Rose McCacken. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. I always love supporting the Special Olympics. I have strong thoughts on what inclusive healthcare should look like. You probably share many of them. We need more trained healthcare professionals knowing exactly how to treat patients with intellectual disabilities. We need more inclusive policies and more access to healthcare for vulnerable populations. And some of the historical realities of how we deliver healthcare can be improved because there's lots of great ideas that are circulating. We wanna let those prosper today. And we're gonna start with Karen Ryan. I'd love if you don't mind, just introduce yourself a little bit and then I'm gonna quiz you about what your life has been like. Thank you, Dr. Oz. Um, my name is Karen Ryan. I am the mother of the beautiful and spirited Violet Lees, who's 12 years old and was born with Down syndrome. So Violet, your daughter, I must keep you hopping. And at the moment of the delivery, when you yes. first learned that she had Down syndrome, you know, what, what, what did you hear and what could they have said differently? It was, it was not ideal. It was a bit of a traumatic experience. Um, she was born by C-section um, the night of the 4th of July. So um, that was a, a unique situation and kind of limited staff and who was there and um, just needing to needing for her health to get her, her out uh, two weeks early. Um, but they immediately noticed soft markers for Down syndrome um, in the eyes. There's some things with the ears and some things with uh, laxity and some of the joints that they noticed when they put her on the warming bed and immediately the tone changed to one of just somberness in the in the um delivery room and that was my first sort of concern and sadness that i wasn't able to sort of celebrate and then they took her away and warmed her up a bit and gave her some extra light and they noticed they thought well we better check because she might have heart problems that's common with children with down syndrome so while i was recovering they um they checked her heart and found two heart holes two holes in her uh she has an atrium atrial septum defect two AC, two us asd holes and um so before I even got to hold my child, I was resting back in my room and in a lot of pain. They just came in to the door. The doctor came in, turned on the lights and said, your child shows all the signs of Down syndrome. And we checked her heart and uh, she has two holes and we need to take her across the street to children's to the ICU. And um, we're on our way. And um, that just really wasn't there was no celebrating her birth. There was no congratulations. I actually didn't even, almost didn't get to hold my child and before she went. And I had no idea what those heart holes would even mean and if she would die or if there would need to be some intervention. So it was just very, um, just very, not the right way to bring a beautiful soul into the world. <laughs> I'm sure you went through that. I can uh, only imagine what it felt like because you have this beautiful experience it's now clouded by lots of fear and you fear most what you don't understand. What advice as a parent would you give 
to healthcare professionals today as it relates to treating folks with intellectual disabilities? Well, I would say, you know, um, take a minute, even if there is something concerning to get not from 10 feet away at the door of the room, but come to the, come bedside or come to, to the parent and say, um, I know this might not have been what you were expecting, but this is a, it's an exciting opera. It's an exciting life. It's a different life, but it's an exciting life and um, congratulations. And to just prov- to just sort of bring about that it's a child first, that this this infant is, um, this beautiful baby is going to bring great joy to you. It may be different, but it will be great. Um, and to just bring more of that, um, not apologizing and not delivering it like a bad piece of news. If we can keep the news positive, I think um, so many more parents will be touched in a better way. How do you advocate for your child in the healthcare system? I, I, I've always admired, especially moms who can stick up and say, you know, there's three things that bother me because it's so intimidating. You don't know all the words, you know, a lot of times people are coming and going faster than you keep track of them. It is. I, I found a very good pediatrician first and she became a good uh, referral for a lot of things. But I think the most important thing is if you see something to ask and to not be afraid, like, oh, that's the disability and when when I can't I, I can't do something about that. You can do something about almost anything. And I think it comes first with asking and finding a doctor who sees your child as a child and not as a an anomaly. Um, book extra time for the appointments would be another um, tangential point to that is to make sure we're giving time and space um, for these extra descriptions and these extra needs. Having doctors... Um, they're, they have a very busy day. And I think um, just again, like, you know, we have crazy lives being the parent of a child with an intellectual disability. We never know exactly how we can't predict how these um, appointments are going to go. And I think when we get there, also just sort of try to extend with us some grace. There's some of some things we're dealing with, we don't know we're going to deal with when we get there. This is uncharted waters for us as well. And I think there's sometimes a healthcare professional expectation that we have a magic pill or we have the magic saying, or we have a magic comfort blanket or something that is going to pull our child back when we lose them from um, something overstimulating them. And so I, I would just say, I know you have a busy schedule and I know things are crazy, but um, continuing to rush when we're having one of those moments isn't going to um, isn't going to help the appointment and help us get to the diagnosis. And so as much as we could all do to have grace and take a deep breath and reassure everyone that it's okay, we're, we see we see you for your what we need to figure out. And we're not going to just stop because we see an unusual behavior, but we're gonna look beyond that to see you as a patient would be really wonderful. We had troubles with her eyes and her ears. She had to have eye surgery for crossing. um, And we found an amazing doctor who was able to help us with her crossing eyes. She, She could have lost an eye if we wouldn't have gotten that intervention. And it was only because I asked and said, should those eyes be crossing like that? She was only six months old and we jumped on it and got it going. And um, after two eye surgeries, she, uh, her eyes, you know, are working great with glasses and she's just, her glasses are part of who she is. And the same with her ear tubes. We had to have several ear surgeries to do tubes and adenoid removal or tube insertion and adenoid removal so that she could, um, hear better and she talks really well as a result. And I think if I hadn't pushed those issues and really explored those early on, we would have missed a lot of developmental, um, a lot of developmental time and had more developmental delays. And with that investment, you're able to get her enrolled in the Special Olympics Young Athletes Program. Why did you feel participating in this endeavor made so much sense for her? Well, I was an athlete growing up um, and in college, and I wanted her to have sport for life. I knew what that was for me to have teenage, to have um, a community through sport um, and what that did for me. And so when I found this program for 
uh, kids age two to seven. Um, it was perfect because I wanted her to get those skills without being in some sort of environment where she may get run over by a room full of typically developing children. So this was a nice mix of typically developing children and children with intellectual disabilities. And it was a great way for her to learn motor skills and even to do singing and talking and to meet other kids um, and have her ready for sport com competition in Special Olympics when she turned eight. And when she turned eight, we got her into Special Olympic sports and it was a perfect preparation. You know, I love sports because it's very empowering. Yeah, yes. And it's also very easy to see if you made it or didn't make it. So you've got to deal with failure and failure is part of life. So, you know, getting yes. knocked down and figuring out how to get up and seeing your parents help you and passing along their skill sets makes a big difference. What health issues do you worry about Violet as she enters her teen years and adult years? I worry about her, you know, down, kids with Down syndrome have a shorter stature. Violet may top out at five feet tall and, uh, and she's going to have, she has a less muscle tone. I worry that she's, I worry about weight control. Um, I worry about her finding, um, evolving from pediatrics to um, adult medicine care, who will be her primary care doctor. How do we find that? How does that person know um, how, to, how to address a person with Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities? Um, and I worry about her living independently. I worry about finding safe housing um, and resources for her so that she can have as her, her rightfully independent life as much as she can, as safely as she can. Yeah. I'm very proud of you. Let me, let me go to Alia Zainab now and Marina Irfan to introduce themselves. Uh, and again, a couple of questions for you. Alia, take it away. Good morning, doctor. Uh, this is uh, Alia. And uh, today I've got the job of uh, interpreting whatever she's going to tell about her life and uh, what, uh, you know, what pain she had gone through and what uh, achievement that at the end she has achieved, that is all going to get, you know, discussed today in your program. I basketball I love basketball. First of all, I America. I won a medal in America. I won a medal in Thank you. My name is Alia Zainab and I'm a basketball player. Um, basketball is my favorite game. Uh, first time I went to uh, America and there I won a bronze medal for Olympics Pakistan. And for the second time, I went to Athens and I won silver medal for my uh, cake. And uh, this is how it is. That's wonderful. Now, I know she had surgery. Uh, again, it's not uncommon, uh, but, but it took a little effort to, to get through it. Can you uh, get some of those details and share them with us? Ali, you have a lot of pain with surgery. Can you tell me about it? I had a lot of pain. I was scared. I had a bad idea. My mood was changed. I had a bad idea. I had a bad idea. In after coming back from Athens in 2011, she. Uh, uh, you know, in um, healthy athlete program screening, she was uh, diagnosed that uh, she is going through a condition called prognathism. Now, this is a condition where the teeth are not aligned. And, you know, the person feel, uh, faces a lot of problem in chewing and swallowing. So this is what she was basically going through. So it was, you know, a great effort of Special Olympics that they had put in their effort to, you know, make her go through the surgeries. And because of those surgeries, after 30 years of her life, that she had started eating solid foods. And before then that, she was on pureed food. She has not been able to eat properly. It was, you know, she was overjoyed when she had this surgery. And after that, she was able to eat all, you know, she started knowing what is the taste of apple. She was eating very soft food earlier, but now she's been able to taste bread, you know, um, apple, walnuts. What does inclusion in healthcare mean to her? How, how did she deal with the healthcare system? Treatment 
मैं मुझसे सवाल कीजिए मेरे पेरेंट्स से मैं एक सवाल कीजिए मेरा हक है मैं जवाब दे सकती हूँ मैं मेरा सीने में दिल है दिल धड़कता है कहने का After 30 years of life, that I had, you know, got this opportunity to enjoy my life in like the other people are doing it. Now, ask. She's saying that ask me, not my parents. That what pain I was going through. I am here to answer what I was going through. You know, the difficulty and the problems that she was facing. So she says that uh, you know she's being very thankful. She's been very uh, you know obliged for the. The special yeah. Olympics that she has uh, got the opportunity to have these uh, surgeries and bring herself to the right, you know, place where she can enjoy her life. Now uh, she says that she's got heart. She has also got the feelings. Like why can't these, you know, special people can't be treated in the same manner like the others are being treated? This is their right. This is their right to have, you know, the the kind of life that the others are enjoying. She was being deprived of it for so long, and like thirty years of life, she after that she has been able to eat properly. Now she is, Alhamdulillah, yeah, not underweight. Also, she is eating with full stomach, Alhamdulillah, and she is now enjoying life as the others are doing. It. सबका हक है मेरा भी हक है मेरे दिल में दिल धड़कता है मेरा भी दिल मेरा दिल जाता है जब फ्री दर्द होता है जब मैं दर्द होता है तो सबको सब स्पेशल सबको ऐसे हाँ सब हम सब लोगों को तकलीफ होती है अच्छा होती है मैं भी चाहती हूँ मैं चाहती हूँ मैं चाहती हूँ आपकी तरह जिंदगी एंजॉय जिंदगी एंजॉय कर सकती हूँ थैंक यू वी नीड टू हैव एन इंक्लूसिव वर्ल्ड लाइक यू नो द हेल्दी कम्युनिटी where there is no discrimination everybody should have equal opportunities everybody must have equal chance to live and enjoy their lives you know uh, she says that she has also got heart that beats she she could also feel that pain and uh, i'm i'm sure there are a number of more of you know the kids like her who would be you know wanting to have such kind of relaxed life where they could you know uh, come out of all the uh, disabilities and problems that they are facing and everybody must have equal chance everybody must be bring onto the you know same platform from where they could be you know uh, treated and everybody must have the equal opportunity and treatment to be done well thank you for ali of translate marina congratulations to your success let me move over to derek boutelier uh, his coach don vader and home support rosemary mcurnan to introduce themselves and again take your time because i i want to understand how the dynamic ends up working for derek Hi, I'm Don Vaders. I'm the coach, um, and my buddy here, right here, is 46-year-old Derek Hoogler, and uh, he had an unbelievable transition in weight loss wow. over his lifetime. So, what happens when you were oh. big, Derek? I'm uh, heavy, and I take a heart attack. And what else? I was like, can't, can't, can't run no more. Couldn't run no more. No. How was your breathing? Pains. Heavy. And, and why did you want to lose the weight? I played for hockey. Yeah, was that what a dream? Dream, yeah. Dream. I mean, you yeah. want to play for hockey? Play for hockey, yeah. And what else do you do now? Now yeah, the COVID's going on. And there are weights and walking. That's it. And what else? And, and, and how about eating? Eating, uh, eat, sl- eat, uh, good. Right, right things. Right things, yeah. Like what do you like? Sometimes you know cereal. Yeah. With beans, yeah. And veggies. Veggies, yeah. And and you follow a what? It's a recipe, food guide. Done. And you had what? High blood pressure. Sure. Yeah. And what else did you have? Uh, arthritis. And, uh, and arthritis. Nerves, yeah. And you, were you diabetic? Yep. Are you now, after all this weight loss, how are you doing? Good. Very great. Uh, do you have any of those things now? No, nope, it's what? gone. It's all gone? Gone, yep. And who did that? Myself. You did it yourself? Yep. So I haven't seen Derek in, uh, well, I guess, eight to ten months, and I knew he was losing weight and he was working on it. 
And uh, anyway, it was floor hockey time, and I got a call from his home, and you know, and they asked, said Derek's ready to come and play for hockey. And I was like, we want him. I don't care. Just show up, Derek. And then all of a sudden, in come this young fella, 150 pounds. Oh my God! I could not believe it. it was a different person. I was like, oh my God, Derek, you did it. You lost all that weight, and look at you. He was so proud coming in with his gear on and everything else like that. I'm um, so, you know what? Derek himself, with the help of this Cornerstone and Retinability staff and Special Olympics, saved his life. I'm so proud of him. That was a big moment for me to watch that man walk through that door. Yep. And at first, I hardly recognized him. He lost so much weight. I'm so proud of you, Derek. That was a moment that I'll never, ever, ever forget. How would you maintain the weight loss? L losing weight is not rare, but keeping it off is remarkable. How would you maintain it, bud? Um, you walking, weights, and uh, I, 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 I ate uh, some food. Come back food, I ate, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. And what else? I ate, I ate, I ate big hamburgers, I think. Big yeah. giant hamburgers. Got rid of them. I drink five, five pops a day. I drink rid them. Yeah, and you're exercising. Exercising. And Rose, who's uh, the, from Cornerstone, their wonderful staff, uh, she can elaborate a little bit more on the uh, doctor aspect of it all yeah. and the treatments they went through. But basically, um, Dr. Oz, this no. gentleman is, is, is uh, an inspiration to Special Olympics here in Canada uh, for what he did. No more pills. And no more pills, no more diabetic. No pills. And, it was no 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 and you had a good experience with doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Hickey, Dr. Hickey, he came back after you. Yeah. And he was like a real good friend. So his experience was positive from that. And Rose probably can elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, um, Derek came to join us at Cornerstone Community Home. We're a community-based uh, residential option. He came in March of 2017 at a weight of a uh, little over 301 pounds. So immediately we, we identified, um, you know, some areas that um, Derek was struggling with, but first and foremost, the, he, Derek was able to voice to us um, some of the goals and some of the things that he, aspirations he had um, and wanted to attain. So we started to look at what we needed to work on him and, and uh, we identified that um, his weight was an obstacle for him. Um, his um, diet, we needed to look at some um, changes we needed to make in the diet, but we needed to make sure that um, we were hearing D Derek's voice through this. So he thus talked constantly about his desire and his dreams to play uh, floor hockey uh, with Special Olympics. And uh, we talked to him about what he thought he needed to do and how we could support him. And he said, I gotta lose weight, I gotta lose weight. And so we started creating a plan together. Um, now we're, we're a group home uh, with staff that are, we're not RNs, um, but we are familiar with helping persons with special needs. And um, Derek, had such a strong desire to start losing the weight. So we just followed Canada's food guide. Uh, we um, eliminated some of the junk foods that Derek um, had been, um, had a pattern of eating. And we had to replace some of his um, um, habits with exercise. And so Derek was very keen to walk. He was very keen to um, lift his weight. Okay. And he, he continued to play Special Olympic sports. And it was in combination with the coaches and the guidance of Special Olympics that we worked in tandem to kind of create this home-based um, setup for Derek to lead him to meet some of his uh, potentials. And he's, he's, been, he's a remarkable guy. He was so dedicated. He just, he eliminated junk foods, but he, we also, he also understood that with the exercise, he could still treat himself. So he didn't have to lose all of the things he loved. So he's worked through all of this. So he's lost in excess of 150 pounds since 2017. 
And then wow. remarkably, he became part of that wolf pack with the Special Olympics team, which we're so proud of him for. So, Derek, Derek tell me about yeah. the wolf pack and, and how did that help you? How did the wolf pack help you, buddy? Come on. Playing for hockey. For hockey, yeah. What was it? Wolf pack. And yeah. well, hot dog guys, and do you like yeah. playing for hockey? Yep. Yeah. Was it yeah. a dream of yours? Yep. Yeah. And you're running up down the floor? Yep. Yeah. And what about all the athletes? Do you get along with them all? Yep. Yeah. And what's a, what's our number one rule? Have fun. Have fun. That's our number one rule, Dr. Oz, is have fun. But Diana, it looks like you have a lot of fun. How, how do you support Derek in his fitness and overall health goals? And what are some of the challenges yeah. that he's had? Well, some of the challenges he had, obviously, is coming from a – I knew Derek before he went to Cornerstone, and uh, in my opinion, he was close to 325, 330. And Cornerstone did a remarkable job. One of the biggest challenges, I'm going to go to an aha moment with you, is uh, basically his very, very first provincial, which would be statewide in the U.S. tournament. His very first shift, he got on the floor. And, of course, after being 300 pounds, he went charging after the ringette. And this young fella, 23 years old, six foot two, 220 pounds, all muscle, the two of them collided. And anyway, down, boom, down Derek went. And uh, when he went down on the ground, oh, my God, my heart was up here. And I come over and I jumped over to see if he's all right. And he said, I'm all right, Bader, man. I'm all right, Bader, man. And the referee said, he said, uh, Derek, you, you, we got to go get you off the floor. And what did you tell me? Don't take you what? Uh, off the floor. Sure, yeah. He looked up at me, Dr. Oz, and he said, I'm going to play it. I got to finish my shift, Bader, man. Don't take me out, Bader, man. Don't me. And that was a moment that I'll never forget. You know, that he, he did that, and despite all the things going on in this life and everything else, and lose all that weight, you did really good. I am. Yep, you are. I am. Don, I love your passion. Thank you. Rosemary, I know it takes a village. A community has to work together to make sure folks with intellectual disabilities have the supports they need to live the full lives they deserve. So you manage Cornerstone Roast. That's the home, again, where Derek lives. What's been your experience helping him connect with doctors to take care of his special needs? Well, my experience with with uh, with Derek is uh, we were very fortunate. Derek was very fortunate to have a dedicated doctor, Dr. Hickey, who um, has looked after Derek most of his life. So he knew Derek and he was aware of Derek's um, intellectual disability and uh, quite in tune with that. So uh, they deserve the same services that you or I would deserve, same diagnostic testing. Um, just because they have um, special needs or they have intellectual disabilities doesn't mean that they don't um, have um, special health needs and that we all have to work together and create um, opportunities that improve health outcomes. It's just uplifting to see people working as hard as they can to make life better for each other. And uh, as Timmy Shriver's told me many times, that the, the management of intellectual disabilities is a litmus test for society because as we manage those around us who have needs, we reflect who we are as a people. So God bless you for all the wonderful work you've done. I congratulate that. And, and I want to just emphasize, emphasize to everybody who's listening, the voices that you've heard today are, are, are some of the most important ones that, that, that are out there talking about the access to quality health care for people with intellectual disabilities. This is an issue that has been ignored for many years hearing from athletes and coaches and parents and caregivers, it makes a difference. And the voices for healthcare inclusion go far beyond those intellectual disabilities, but it's much more visible in this setting. And we can get to a place of fixing these inequalities um, and by helping everyone get the care that they need. If we prioritize the population, we can do it exactly that starting today. So thank you everyone for joining us. God bless you to all the athletes, especially for participating. Thank you. And I'll see you thank Bye, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank Oz. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Oz. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Aaliyah, Marina, Derek, Don, Rose. I love that last line. Don't take me off the floor. I want to be in the game. I want to compete. I want to be in the action. That's the sentiment each of us needs. It's not just about the athletes, gang. It's about all of us. Any person watching this, either live right now or in the future, remember that invitation is an invitation to you. Don't let anybody take you off the floor. Don't let anybody tell you you're down. Don't let anybody tell you you can't get back up. 
Don't let anyone stop us from achieving the goals we've set out here. All right, enough from me. Uh, I get the chance now to hand this over to the first in history chief health officer of the Special Olympics movement, a person we stole away from UCLA from these big academic centers. Why? Because she saw what those big institutions do and she wanted to go to the people that are making a difference. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Alicia Pisano and to invite her to introduce my classmate from college. God forbid you think that we were in the same classes. We were in the same college. Uh, but Dr. Peter Hotez, thank you for joining us and for bringing your daughter, uh, the newest, freshest, and probably the smartest Dr. Hotez, Dr. Emily Hotez too. Over to you, Alicia. Thank you, Tim. And thank you so much, Dr. Hotez, for being with us. Um, Peter, I, I, you are an amazing scientist, pediatrician, have, has led the way in global health, and especially now in vaccines, all of tropical disease control, and as founding dean of the Baylor College of Medicine, National School of Tropical Medicine, um, Peter has received so many commendations across the world, including the World Health Organization, Abraham Horowitz, award and is such an accomplished author. I know I have read um, and taken in several of your books. I'm so um, thrilled that you can be here today and, and really, really appreciative of your time, especially in the middle of COVID, knowing that um, your, your time across the world is incredibly valued right now and as we need your guidance on this. Um, and then Emily, thank you so much for spending the time with us as well. Um, you, you came from my alma mater, so we have it all in the family here. Um, Dr. Hotez, Emily, uh, as an assistant professor of medicine and a developmental psychologist and researcher at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Both of you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your um, wisdom, both as uh, leaders in the field and then also as family members. Really appreciate um, you taking the time. So um, how about we start off here? Uh, we've, we've heard so much from the perspectives of, of athletes and families um, and confronting significant challenges in the healthcare delivery system. So as healthcare professionals, what have you seen as the general attitudes towards people with intellectual disability? And Peter, can you share some stories or some examples of that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I appreciate the opportunity. And I was impressed that Tim Shriver, no doubt from his Yale education, was able to figure out that uh, the other Dr. Hotez is far more intelligent and <laughs> capable than the one you're hearing from right now. So that was very perceptive of you, Tim. Uh, no, I appreciate this. Um, you know, listening, I was very moved, by the way, by the previous uh, session. And I really appreciated Dr. Rao's sentiment that this is a litmus test for our society because if if we can't help um, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, what kind of society are we or or help them help themselves? And so I think that, you know, it sounds like a straightforward statement. I think of it as a very profound statement uh, also. Um, my perspective in this, I'm a vaccine scientist and uh, pediatric researcher, but um I'm also the parent of, and it's Emily's sister, Rachel, who has uh, autism and a number of intellectual disabilities. And in fact, we um, wound up doing whole exome sequencing um, with Rachel and my wife, Ann and I, in order to identify uh, a gene, one of the hundred genes linked to autism and intellectual disabilities. It's a neuronal cytoskeleton uh, gene involved in neuronal connections, which makes a lot of sense. Um, for autism genes. In fact, there's about 100 now that have been now um, detailed by the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT, you know, headed previously by Eric Lander. Now he's the chief science advisor to, to the president. But um, with the San Stanley Center at, at um, the Broad Institute, most of them are involved in excitatory inhibitory uh, neurons and neuronal communication, which makes a lot of sense with Rachel. The issue, though, is when you have um, a gene mutation, it seldom just covers one system. And in fact, Rachel's got complex medical illness, which includes heart illness, metabolic syndrome. And for me, I think, you know, for why, for Ann and I and for, and for Emily, I think the challenge has been identifying comprehensive medical care for her with all of those things going on. And and it's gotten worse. So, you know, when she was a child, you know, children's hospitals 
it's not perfect by any means and and it varies from place to place but they kind of get it they kind of understand the complex nature of gen genetic uh conditions and uh the multitude of services required and and the and all the different specialties neurology cardiology genetics etc but for me and and the reason i was so excited to have the opportunity to come here is the transition to a to becoming an adult that's where the bottom has really fallen out at so many different levels. First of all, um, and and there's the added complexity of being in, in Texas, which, you know, the services are just there. You know, I hate to say it, but it's just not nearly at the level of, you know, when we were living in, in Connecticut um, or even Maryland as, as it is down here in Texas. So so I think that for me, the one of the big problems is coordinating all of her medical care and making certain you have the insurance coverage and and this is one of the things that i've said to the leadership of of baylor college of medicine here in the texas medical center you know if you build it you'll come i mean they do have something called transition care but it's it's not you know if you look at the institute a lot of the institutions it's just not at that same level as it is at children's hospitals where you have it as a, a bona fide adult specialty you know, caring for people with disabilities and helping in the coordination of all the visits, you know, the, the cardiology visits, the going back to the genetics groups and, and of course the psychiatric care and, and, you know, what psychiatrist takes insurance anymore, which is also a, a, a huge issue. And, and even, you know, and, you know, she has oppositional issues about going to the medical appointment. So, Going to a medical appointment is not not straightforward for Rachel. It's it's a big deal. She has an OCD component to her behavior, so she obsesses about it for weeks on end. So you know, do we tell her weeks ahead of time, or do we tell her that morning and and having and not and you know we we sort of have to wing it and and you know I say to Anne, you know my wife, I said look I've and I've got an MD and a PhD and kind of know a little bit how to navigate the system. Um, but I would imagine if you, you you know you don't have that link and you don't have you know because I can you know if something doesn't work out I can actually you know call the physician or the healthcare provider on their cell phone oh Dr Hotes I'm so sorry no 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 and then you know it all kind of gets fixed but you know that's very unusual right the vast majority of people don't have access to that so how do we you know recreate um, on the adult medicine side, what I think has been more successful in pediatrics in terms of complex care of people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities? That's, that's an excellent um, question uh, to, to lead us. And thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts and, and your experiences as a, as a parent. I think that um, what's telling is that um, you've experienced the the shift in, in some places you get better care, in some places it's it's not as good of a quality, nor is it a good of as good of an experience. You have the ability to be able to um, change that, to be able to uh, get on the phone, but 99% of people or more don't as family members, as individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, and that's kind of the beginning of that cycle of disparity where um, there are increased needs, there's not enough preventive care, not enough services, and there ends up being hospitalizations and, um, and early deaths. So I'm wondering if you did have a perspective to give on um, what, what great, great care coordination would look like, um, what you need from a healthcare professional. Um, can you give us that vision of what a, a great healthcare experience would be? You know, for, for me, well, I'll just say very briefly, just for me, it's it's the more one stop shopping you can have, the better. Um, and, you know, because it's not only identifying the different medical specialties, but the insurance issues are always daunting. And then getting guidance on, you know, do we, uh, you know, how, how do we arrange her her status as an independent adult? Um, versus being linked to us and, and talking to lawyers about that. There's just a myriad of, of legal, social, and medical issues, and it's it's completely fragmented. And, and you can make it a full-time job, Just and Anne often has to do that when I, when I can't, kind of tracking that down. 
Yeah, to, that's what we've experienced in our healthy communities is really the linkages to community care is the challenge, biggest and, and challenge. Also, just, and the other thing that we have found, especially with social services at the county and state level, there's a high turnover of personnel. People don't stay in their yeah. jobs very long, at least down here in Texas. So you sure. do an intake with a social worker and you, you, you think you've hit it off and and um, you've got it all in place and then you don't hear from anybody for four months and say, hey, whatever happened? And you call, oh no, that person has resigned and gone to another opportunity. Yeah, and, yeah. And so you're starting over again. So you feel a bit like Sisyphus rolling up that rock. Especially during those transition times. Emily, I wonder if you can um, share some of your insights as a, as a younger professional. How do you see this time, this moment for students and the new generation of health professionals and researchers in the field? Has there been, um, has there been progress that's been made or where do you see that being manifested? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is wonderful to learn from you and your colleagues this morning, uh, this morning here in LA. Um, so what I see uh, among my colleagues is a shift towards what we call a neurodiversity oriented approach to healthcare. Um, so we really argue that healthcare institutions need to promote a culture of neurodiversity. So that's an organizational culture largely focused on accessibility, uh, patient empowerment, uh, self-advocacy, uh, and self-determination in care. Uh, a culture of neurodiversity may be more commonly understood by physicians as precision medicine. Uh, so precision medicine uh, seeks to essentially replace the one size fits all approach to medicine, kind of this rigid adherence to protocols that may not meet the needs of individuals with disabilities or be responsive to their uh, distinct priorities and experiences. And it really seeks to promote a really customized preventative and therapeutic approach to caring for people with disabilities. Um, so my colleagues and I at UCLA are really invested in creating a neurodiversity oriented approach to healthcare for people with ID. And uh, I, I'll also say um, I am on the leadership team of a large research network called the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, uh, led by Dr. Alice Kuo at UCLA. And uh, something that we're the most proud of in our AIRP network is the establishment of an autistic researcher review board. So this is uh, the first ever uh, review board uh, run by autistic researchers themselves in a national research network. And uh, they are really guiding the priorities of the research that is supported within the network. And I'm really hopeful that the next generation of healthcare professionals will adapt similar models to uh, the model that we're adapting in the AIRP, where they are developing uh, practices and clinical guidelines in consultation and collaboration with people with disabilities themselves. Um, this is something that I'm working on at UCLA with uh, medical students here in creating a curriculum really focused on uh, the needs of people with a range of disabilities. Um, and uh, I'm seeing this play out uh, in, my, in my colleagues' research labs and practices. So I'm hopeful that this will be a, a pattern that continues. Thank you so much, Emily. That, that's a um, very, very wonderful vision. Um, the athletes, people with intellectual disabilities, co-researching co with, um, with people without intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have little time left. I just want to finish off with a, a question that's just so relevant on everybody's minds since we have you here, um, Peter. Um, it, it's a it's an unusual time for vaccines, for your work, COVID, and vaccination in general. But this isn't a new time for for vaccine hesitancy or concerns. Um, what message should we take away from these times for our athletes and families? Um, how can how can um, we help? Uh, navigate? Well, actually, uh, together with Emily, we've written uh, a couple of articles uh, about this because of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities too often have not been uh, prioritized for this, despite the fact that absolutely they require full immunization 
uh, for COVID, but also there are other uh, childhood vaccinations as, as well. And of course, there's this outdated idea that vaccines somehow can actually lead to intellectual and developmental disabilities, which has now been widely debunked, or at least I, I've helped to do that. So I, I'd give the last word to Emily about that, see, see what she ha has to say, since she was the lead author on one of, the, one of our papers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, as I mentioned before, one of the um, kind of largest uh, shortcomings um, in caring for people with disabilities is a lack of communication with people with disabilities themselves. Uh, physicians do not have authentic and meaningful collaborations, uh, relationships with people with disabilities. And this is not just limited to healthcare settings, but uh, this is the result of a lifetime of exclusion and marginalization of people with disabilities. Uh, so healthcare uh, misinformation, for example, is, is one example of many um, that have uh, created health disparities. So in thinking through uh, the uh, va promoting vaccines for uh, this population, promoting vaccine uptake and access, uh, our work has really uh, shown light on the need to uh, create really targeted uh, public health messaged, messaging approaches that really speak to the specific uh, needs of people with disabilities and don't treat them as monolithic or um, homogenous. Uh, we work with a wonderful organization called the Hood Medicine Initiative, uh, my father and I, and uh, they really uh, emphasize the need to speak to segmented populations. Um, so really uh, thinking about uh, approaches to public health messaging that uh, do not uh, speak to uh, overarching generalizations, uh, but really yeah. try to meet populations where they are. Thank you so much. Thank you both. And this actually goes right back to the first thing that Dr. Patel said about um, invisible disabilities. So thank you so much for, for this incredibly, incredibly insightful conversation. We have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, and the first one is for um, Dr. Patel. Do you think that COVID has helped or hurt efforts to reduce health disparities among individuals with intellectual disabilities and other marginalized populations? Thanks very much. What a fascinating conversation this has been. Uh, I think it goes without saying that COVID has massively amplified existing historic disparities. I mean, I think this is obvious and evident in every single metric. And if I want to just turn to the specific uh, subject that we have been so passionately discussing in these last uh, uh, hour and a half, uh, the well-being of people with intellectual disabilities, I want to just give two examples, one of which has already been touched on earlier, which is the increased vulnerability of people with intellectual disabilities to be infected, but moreover, mm -hmm. more importantly, to then uh, experience higher rates of hospitalization and mortality uh, when they're infected. And it's interesting I say this because whereas in some countries intellectual disabilities have been recognized as a comorbidity, this is by no means uh, the rule. In most countries, when the word comorbidities were being described as a priority group for people to receive vaccination, for example, um, it was incredible that mental health disabilities, disabilities such as IDs, were completely absent from that list. Even now, even now, in spite of all the evidence. But the other kind of uh, uh, area where disparities have been enhanced, and this is something that's very close to my heart, Alicia, is the issue of schooling. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of, of it is, this is a very polarizing issue, uh, of course, and I'm not referring to the question of whether schools should have been opened or closed. I'm just simply referring to the fact that when they were closed, what was the attention that was given to individuals, children and young people who had intellectual disabilities and whose schooling had been disrupted? To my knowledge, at least in the global south, um, none at all. There was zero recognition that children with intellectual disabilities had certain learning needs uh, that could not be met through routine remote learning opportunities that could be actually harnessed by kids um, you know, without those difficulties. Of course, that effectively increased the disparities that already existed in terms of access to quality education. And I wanna end by one very important group of people who were also um, uh, affected by this, it's their parents. Um, the parents who have children with learning difficulties had no additional support 
provided by any agency in the state for the fact that, that they were now also, in fact, not only caring for their child full time during the day, which they hadn't been doing when the schools were open, but secondly, they were actually having to deal almost single handedly with their learning. needs. So disparities have increased enormously. And I think it's a wake up call to recognize that systems in most countries of the world have failed to recognize the unique and special needs of children and their families uh, when intellectual disability is in play. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. And the, the sense of isolation and, uh, and lack of supports is tremendous there. Uh, Kira, I think we want to end, if we can, for, with hearing from you, um, which is if you could have healthcare professionals do anything to make you feel better in that doctor's appointment, what is the one thing or a couple of things that they should be doing? Thank you for a great question. So I would say have real expectations of people with intellectual disability. Sometimes traditionally, when you are a person with ID, some people do have low expectations just because you have a disability. The diagnosis helps you get the supports and the help that you need. But I would say see the person with ID as a person. There's two halves of you. Not just see you as a name with lots of labels on a sheet of paper. See you as a human being and you do have feelings and thoughts. I'd say listen to that person with ID because it can be really overwhelming in a doctor's office. Ask them how they're feeling. Don't rush them for answers. Let them have thinking times. Try and not rephrase the question once you've already asked the question because it can take you a while just to rethink of another answer to the question that's just been said. I would also say as well, in health and work, why should people with ID only be given one option and be lucky that you've, they've actually been given that option in life? Why can't they have a choice? Let them choose what option, which one they want. I'd like to give you an example. You have your favourite superstore that you like shopping to. And one put, it could be Tesco's, Asda and Marks and Spencer's if you're quite posh. <laughs> and somebody says, you can only go to Tesco's. Now, somebody without an ID would straight away and say, why? I like to buy this item from Marks and Spencer's. I like to buy this item from Asda. And I like to buy this item from Tesco. But a person with ID wouldn't traditionally have that option. And if they do have the confidence, they would say, well, why not? But then I would say that for a person who doesn't have that confidence, the people who know them best are the doctors. So why can't those doctors be that somebody? For that person like their family members are. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you so much, Kira. That I I think we can all take away that a tremendous, tremendous uh, ending. Why can't we all just take care of each other? So um I I wanna say thank you to everybody here today um, for this enlightening conversation. Thank you to all the athletes and families who we work for and serve. Um, to Tom Galasano, Anne uh, Costello, the executive director of the Galasano Foundation, without whom this couldn't be happening in the work around the world in 122 countries in our healthy communities wouldn't be happening. Um, thank you to all of our inclusive health partners, over 5,000 partners around the world, um, and to our programs as well for all of our volunteers, our staff, our health messengers. Um, our health messengers are the voices that we heard over and over again need to be heard, um, heard by our health professionals, heard by our leaders. And, and, uh, and, and especially um, thank you to um, everybody here, everybody who has supported all of this work. Um, Tim, I'll, I'll uh, leave it off to you. We're, we're, we're right on time. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you to the, all our panelists, Dr. Tell, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Oz, Mike, so many other people who joined us on Mehmet, uh, Dr. Oz's conversation. Uh, Kira, thank you. Uh, uh, 
speak uh, to see the to see the person. Um, uh, these are powerful words echoed by professionals who have heard your voice. And I think everyone on this call now looks at you, I'm sure right now, as an icon, as, a, as, a, as an inspiration, but also uh, as a source of strength. I know I do. Uh, I hear your voice. I hear your experience. I see your beautiful smile, your extraordinarily strong uh, will, uh, your athletic capacity. Um, in all these things, there are social determinants of change, not just of health. There are social determinants of uh, vaccine uh, uh, uptake. Um, but all of us, I think, uh, join uh, in thanking you and, and maybe especially Emily also, the younger generation, the generation raised on neurodiversity, not on disability. Um, Tom Galassano, you have empowered a revolution. And we, uh, your foot soldiers, are determined to bring it to a successful conclusion. And so in the strongest possible way, we thank you. Uh, we will not rest until we get this job done. Kira, the last word goes to you. Remember, everybody needs someone in their lives. Is this you? I think it can be. Thank you all. <laughs>